Uh, so this morning, we kind of started last week, but this morning is kind of the official start of a um, series of sermons um, about the names of God. It's taken from Psalm 9, verse 10. It says, those who know their name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never uh, forsaken those who seek you. And the promise there is, and the motivation there is, that when people know the name of God, when people know the titles of God, the names of God, when we come to know the integrity and the faithfulness of God, um, we will trust him more, we will seek him more, and we will learn that he'll never um, forsake us. I was, I was reminded of, of that verse this week. I've been thinking about that, that verse for weeks as we prepare for this sermon. As we pray for, prepare for Joey to teach us a song with a lot of Hebrew in it, I'm kind of excited about learning to sing some Hebrew. Um, are we going to do Hebrew dances? That's what I'm really looking forward to. We'll see about that. But I've been thinking about this thing. Those who know their name, your name will put their trust in you. And it came to me this week that I had a perfect illustration. I was talking to my father-in-law last night. Papa was, we were on the phone, and he had a great illustration of this when he was uh, attempting to get um, his benefits for being a, a veteran, for being uh, going to Vietnam and serving in a, in a mass unit there. And he, he, he suffering from Parkinson's and all that that brought on and all related to that. And he, he could not get his full veteran's benefits. And he spent two years going to offices and this test and that test and seeing this person and this person. All these people with all these different titles and all these different names. And he just couldn't get things moving. And then one day here, uh, at Creekside Bible Church, someone said to him, well, why don't you go see your congressman? Why don't we pick this up a notch? Why don't we go with a title that's bigger than every title you've talked to? And he's like, good idea. So he goes, takes off his paperwork, and the congressman's not there. Um, but there was a lady there, and, you know, she was like, he said, I knew she was important because she had the biggest desk and the biggest piles of paper. So I went to her, and... Um, Got to talk to her, told her my situation, gave her my paperwork, and I, he, said, he said he found out when he was talking to her that she had been a surgical nurse. Now, I don't know what surgical nurse means to you, but my father-in-law was in a mass unit in Vietnam, and he knew that if someone was cut open in surgery, that the surgeon did not close them up until the nurse said he could. She had to make sure that everything was okay in there. Did you leave any gauze? Did you leave any sponges? Did you leave any clamps? Is there anything? Okay, doctor, you may do finish the job. And like she calls the shots, and he was like, oh, this is going to take, this is going to get taken care of. This is the lady who knows how to cause the shots. Guess what? After two years of work, in 48 hours, she had it solved, and he had his benefits, right? There's something to be said for a title. There's something to be said for the capability and the ability that is found in a name. And we've all probably proven that at different times in our lives. Um, sometimes you don't even remember the name. You just remember the title that went with the name. Those who know their, your name, God, those who know your name, O oh Lord, will put their trust in you. So that's the journey we're on for the next several weeks until we can get back into First John. Um, learning about all the names and titles of God. And this morning... Um, what a better place to start. We're going to have two weeks in the Christmas story in Matthew 1 uh, to look at a couple of the names of God as found in his son, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. And so this name comes today at um, maybe a time that's not unlike our own. Um, Matthew chapter 1 in my Bible is preceded by a blank page and then a page that says nothing on it but the New Testament and then another blank page, and then uh, part of a page that has the ending of Malachi. And those blank pages in your Bible represent 400 years of silence. Um, God's at work, but he's not speaking through his prophets. God's at work because God never stops uh, working on behalf of his people, but it's 400 years of silence. No prophet is spoken. And into that silence, um, an, an angel comes to a young girl named Mary, teenage girl Mary, Tells her uh, she's going to have a child. And then, <laughs> then Mary comes to Joseph. Hey, Joseph, I got a message for you. And it came um, with a name. The message to Joseph came with actually two names. One this week, one next week. Um, but it came to a man who thought that he had weighed all the options, and he had. 
likely weighed the options. Um, but God came to him and said, I'm going to take you down an option, down a path that you didn't think you were going to go. And I just think that's so appropriate uh, that this name comes to us in that sort of historical context because we live in a day where maybe you're discouraged, where the days seem dark, where maybe um, you just don't seem like we're hearing from God or you're hearing from God, like the heavens are silent for you. Um, Or maybe um, one of the things we see in our land is that, and all over the world really, it's not our country, it's everywhere, um, people's options seem to be narrowing, right? People are losing their jobs, people are losing loved ones, people are losing their lives, and when that happens, you begin to think, as you look at your situation, I don't see any way out of this. Um, There's no good path to take in this situation. If that's where you feel like you are, and if that's where the people around you feel like they are, and I believe that's where a lot of people believe they are, then I have a name for you today, and it's the name Emmanuel. We sang the name. We'll come back to that song in a minute. We sang the name Emmanuel, God with us. And let's look in this story in Matthew 1 and see how this name came um, to this young man, Joseph. Matthew 1, starting in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now we pick up the story after the angel has already come uh, to Mary and said, Mary, you're going to be pregnant. And she asked the perfectly natural biological question, I've never been with a man, how can I be pregnant? And God explains, um, Mary, this is happening by... The Spirit, the Holy Spirit is doing this, and so she is found to be with child through the Spirit, our text says. Um, Before she and Joseph had ever come together, they were were engaged, they were betrothed, which is is not engaged, it's more than engaged. Um, This means the families have come together, they've made a pledge to one another, it's almost like a contract has been signed, and the timeline starts off, the clock starts ticking, to when the wedding day will happen. And it's such an arrangement that it takes a divorce to break it. Go back to Deuteronomy 24, and you can see how that can take place. And Joseph believes he's found himself in just such a situation because Mary goes to him and tells him, "Uh, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Naturally speaking, Joseph knows it's not him. There's only one answer to that question because no matter... How much we say it, childbirth is not miraculous, right? We look at little brand new babies and they're so sweet and cute and we say, oh, babies are such a miracle. They're really not. We understand the biology behind babies, right? It's beautiful. It's amazing where you thank God. But there's a natural process for how babies come into the world. Um, Joseph knows that process. Mary tells him this. And so he starts considering what he will do. And it says, Joseph was a righteous man. Boy, we could preach a sermon on on Joseph, just this verse. He was a righteous man. He was a God-fearing, law-keeping, God-seeking, God-trusting man. He was known as a righteous man. He was a righteous man. But he also did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace. There was a way this could be done. You could call the elders together. You could call the people together. And you could give a formal accusation of Mary. She's pregnant. It wasn't me. I divorced her. She is put to public shame. Everybody knows. So we see this dilemma. And Joseph is weighing his options. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 20, it says, after he had considered this, the word consider 
means to weigh things. It means to meditate on things. It means to look at things and weigh them out, right? Maybe you've done this. Maybe you've been faced with choices and you just had to get out a legal pad, a piece of paper and a pen and just start writing out every option you could think of. And how can I do this? And maybe I can do this. And maybe I can do this. And there's all these paths. This is what Joseph is doing. He's weighing things. And with love for God and love for Mary, he decides this. This is, this is what he weighed out. I'll divorce her, but I'll do my best to make sure she is not put to public disgrace. Now, he also knows that eventually she's going to look pregnant. And eventually people are going to come to Joseph and go, Joseph, we thought you were a righteous guy, and then he's going to have to explain the situation, but he can at least put that off and not publicly disgrace Mary. So Joseph is a man of incredible meekness, um, incredible righteousness, incredible peace, incredible integrity, incredible love for Mary. And when he weighs everything out, when he's considered everything, this is a path he should take. But then an angel appears <laughs> and says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid. Um, remember last week, the angel appeared to the shepherds and it was first word out of his mouth. Don't be afraid. And I, I think if there's a pattern in Scripture, it's that sometimes the greatest moment in your life, the greatest transforming, path-changing moment in your life comes in answer to a moment of fear. Take her, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. See, that had been one of the options, and he didn't consider that the option he could take. That did not carry the weight that it should because taking her home as, as his wife has its consequences, right? Um, don't be afraid because what she told you is true. The baby in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and she's going to give birth to a son. You're having a boy, Joseph. And you're going to name him Jesus. Yahweh saves because he will save his people from their sins. That's my sermon next week. All of this took place. Matthew gives a little commentary here. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And this is the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 7. The virgin will give, be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. And um, it seems to be the case that he just went ahead and married her. Um, and yet we see here this fulfilled a prophecy. If you have the message, a paraphrased translation of the Bible, it says that there was a prophecy that was pregnant, and this gave birth to the prophecy. I love the turn of phrase there. But let's go back uh, to Isaiah chapter 7 for just a moment. We need to do this because I think it shines light on this. There's a prophecy about God with us. Now, if you've read your Bible, you know this is not uncommon. Now, God is omnipresent. God is equally in all places. There is never a place where God is not. So there's always a sense that God is with you, right? But but when the Bible talks about God with you, it means he's really present and with you. And this, this isn't really hard to explain. Um, ladies, you know what it's like to be with your husband when he's not with you, right? Right, you've done this. Hey, are you listening to me? Are you paying attention? Do you hear what I say right now? Are you with me? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I heard all of that. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, right. You know what it's like to be with somebody who's not really with you, right? You know what it's like to watch a movie, right? And, and hero number one turns to his sidekick and says, are you with me? And they rush into the burning building or rush to find the bad guy, right? There's a with that is, that is, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm fighting on your behalf. We're in this uh, together. And that's all throughout your Old Testament. That's Abraham. That's Isaac. That's Jacob. The promise is always there. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. It's the promise to Moses. Hey, listen, I'm going to go with you to Pharaoh. I'm going to go with you to the promised land, right? It's a promise to Joshua. 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's the promise to David. It's the promise all throughout the Old Testament that when God makes a promise and you need something you don't have, God will be with you to give you what you need and he will fight on your behalf. And so we come to this situation in Isaiah 7 where it's, it's just hopeless. So a couple of weeks ago, I believe, maybe last week, I can't remember, I talked about Assyria, this northern kingdom that was like the big bully of the world way back in the days of Isaiah. And they were just knocking these little countries off left and right, going in, taking the people, wiping them out, and they're on the door. They're on Judah's door, okay? Two other countries, um, Israel and Syria, not Assyria. So Assyria is the big bad guy. Israel and Syria see them coming, and they're like, we need to do something here. So they go to Judah and said, hey, let's, let's make a pact, the three of us. Let's let the three of us stand together, and we'll fight against Assyria. Surely the three of us together will be enough. And King Ahaz hears this, and he's, he's, he's got to consider his options. Okay, so I joined those two. We fight Assyria. You know, I don't like my chances there. I'm going to go to Assyria and see if I can just kind of say, here, look, here's some money. Don't beat us up. Take it easy on us. And he tells Israel and Syria, no, I'm not teaming up with you. And they eventually get wiped out by Assyria. It's, it's kind of an ugly situation. But, but it, Isaiah comes to Ahaz and says, look, um, God's going to take care of this situation for you because they've now got three countries against them. And, and, and Ahaz is scared, and, and Isaiah says, listen, God's going to take care of this. God is going to take care of this situation. It looks hopeless. It looks dark. You don't know what's going to go on here. You, don't, you know how this is going to turn out. You don't see any way that this could go well. Um, God is going to take care of this. And then as God tells Isaiah to tell Ahaz something. He says, tell Ahaz that if he wants to, he can even ask me for a sign, right? Just, I'll be gracious. I'll give him a sign. He's doubting. Just, just tell him to ask, give me a sign, God. If you ask, I'll give him one. And Ahaz kind of feigns humility and says, oh, no, no, I could never ask God for a sign. And God says to Isaiah, well, Isaiah, I'm going to give him one anyway. And so the sign is this, that there will be a virgin or a young lady who will give birth and you're going to call him Emmanuel, God with us. And there's this interesting little line. Um, By the time it says he eats curds and honey and knows right from wrong, I will have taken care of this situation. So what does that mean? That means by the time he's eating solid food, by the time he's weaned, by the time he's a, a toddler, this situation will entirely be taken care of. Trust me, Ahaz. And guess what happened? Ahaz refused the sign. Ahaz didn't trust God, and he starts trying to work out a deal with Assyria. And God's just like, okay. If you won't take that sign, then here's, forget the Emmanuel sign. Forget the, you will give birth to a child and call him Emmanuel, God with us. If you don't take that sign, then here's the sign. There's going to be a baby born, and it's going to have the longest name in the Old Testament. I've never met anyone who said, yeah, here's a good Bible name. I'm giving my name, my kid this name. The baby is going to be born. His name is going to be Mahershalal Hashbaz. Anybody ever met a Mahershalal Hashbaz? Yeah, I'm figuring no. And basically it means um, your fall and your spoil will be quick. Um, You're going down, you're getting wiped out, and it's going to happen. And that's what happens when you reject the sign. Yeah, God's going to be with you, but if you remember in the Minor Prophets, sometimes God with you for judgment was not a good thing. And so it didn't go well for King Ahaz. And so now you fast forward all those years, you fast forward through Israel in exile and Judah in exile and then Judah coming back from Babylon. Then you go through these silent years and this rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the wall and the people coming back and this this 400 years of silence and now angels appear to just two people. (laughs) Not to the whole country, but these angels appear to two people and 
there is a pregnant virgin and a righteous husband, and they're going to have a kid, and he's going to be Emmanuel, God with us, God for us, God with us, Joseph. Joseph, you've weighed the options. Joseph, you've meditated on this. Joseph, you've figured out all the different ways this could go and what that will mean for you. And it will mean ridicule for for you if you go this way, ridicule for both of you if you go this way, or just her, and you can kind of get out of this. And, And Joseph, you've weighed this all out. Good for you, Joseph. You're a righteous, loving man. It's good that you meditated on this. It's good that you weighed this out. But you need to know something, Joseph. God is with you, and you're going to go down the path you didn't choose. And it was the hardest path. And that path is you and Mary married, having a kid that's going to save people from their sins, and he's going to be called Emmanuel, God with you. So, Joseph, you're a good, good man, and I am with you you and your child is going to show the world that God is with us. And so what do you see in the life of Christ? You see um, all these situations. You see Nicodemus, a Pharisee, showing up at night and saying, teacher, um, nobody could do the things you're doing unless God were with you. Right, and we, we see this happening, and Jesus performs this miracle, and people are like, oh, God's with this guy. God's with us. To the point that they're like, God's with us. God's with us, right? Hey, Emmanuel's here. Emmanuel's here. God's with us, right? And then Jesus starts telling the disciples he's leaving, which is hard because God was with us. And he says... I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. My spirit will be in you. Which in a way is better than with you. (laughs) I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. We saw this in all those upper room chapters of John. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I won't be here physically. I'll be here by my spirit, but I'll still be with you. And he even gave him the great commission. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And hey, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm for you. And then you get to Paul, and he talks about how God is doing this thing where he's bringing the, all these people from different ethnic backgrounds and Jew and Gentile, and men and women and slave and free and all these things. And he's bringing them together and he says he's creating a dwelling where God lives by his spirit. God is with us. God was with Mary and Joseph in what seemed like an impossible situation where the options were limited. And he's like, no, it's going to be the hard path. God is with you. And Jesus was with them, and God was with them. And he says, I'm still going to be with you. And you fast forward to the very end of the book in Revelation 21. It says, and now the dwelling place of God is with man. It's just, I'm going to be with you, with you, with you. And we, we saw that when he returns in robes of white, right, the blazing sun will pierce the night right? My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face, all the saints rising up. He's with us. He's with us. He's dwelling with us. It's the promise from the beginning to the end of Scripture that God is with us, that he's creating a people who he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. So we sing this song, this this, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It sounds... um, There's so much longing in that song, isn't there? It's not your usual Christmas song. It's actually, from everything I learned, it's the oldest Christmas song we sing. It actually goes back and it was written in the triple digits 1,200 years ago in Latin, a Latin Christmas song. Uh, Next week, Joey will actually teach us to us in the original Latin. No, he will not. That will not happen. Um, Translated into English, this is a 1,200-year-old song, and it just has this sense of yearning and longing. It's very plaintive. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And, and you can and ransom captive 
Israel. It's, it's, it's almost as if it was written in those blank pages between the Testaments. It almost sounds like it was written in a, by a person in days of darkness who didn't seem to have many options. <laughs> come, Emmanuel, come, Emmanuel. And he gives him all these different names, right? The desire of nations and the day spring. Come, cheer our hearts, right? Bind our wounds. Come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. It's such, such a, a song of longing. And when you see how the story goes, we're still saying, Emmanuel, you came. You came, Emmanuel. You were with us. God was with us. You are with us still, Emmanuel, because that's what you promised. And we know your name, so we trust in you. And you've never forsaken those who trust you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So you're with us. Come, Emmanuel, and be with us. Make this place your dwelling place. God is with us. God is for us. As Paul said, God is for us. Who can be against us? And there are some times in life, um, last year on my sabbatical, which ended about this time, um, last year. Um, it was one of the things uh, my counselor told me. Sometimes in life, when you have no idea what to say or what idea what to do, God's presence has to be enough for you. God's presence must be enough. God's with us, family. God's with us. And I don't know where you are in your life. Um, You may be at a place where you're just weighing your options and trying to figure out what to do next. This was an all things considered moment. Um, Options weighed moment. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe, Maybe the best thing for you, and I know that Kelly and I have done this at least a couple of times in our life. It was like, we don't know what's next. Let's get out a legal pad. Let's get out a pen. And let's just start writing every option we can think of and what it will take to make it happen and what the outcome might be. And let's just cry out to God um, for wisdom and just let him guide us. And that's a good thing. I think, I think God says, I know he says in his word, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you without finding fault. So just... Sit down and weigh it all and pray and ask for advice and seek wisdom. But there's also a prayer that Kelly and I have prayed on numerous occasions. And that is, okay, God, when all is said and done, we pray that the decision wouldn't even have to be a decision. Just just go ahead and make it for us. And here it is. Here's our situation. We're putting it before you. We're seeking wisdom. But if you just want to jump in and be with us and make the decision, we'll let you do that, which is exactly what God did here. Okay, Joseph, you've considered everything, but really here's what the decision is. You're taking Mary to be your wife. I'm going to be with you. Joseph didn't get in a big fight with the angel. That's not what I decided, right? No, it's you decided. Okay, this is what we'll do. And I don't know where you are in your life, but I know that we're at a period in history where it feels like our options are limited. And I don't know what you feel like the weight of your options are, but can I just tell you, God is with you, and that is enough. It's Christmas. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And his presence is enough. I was, a couple of months ago, I remember taking a Sunday off, and I spent some time at, up at the farm just fasting and praying, and I, I got this line. I was, just, I was riding out and just thinking and pondering, and there was this, this line. I can't remember exactly how the line was worded, but it was something along uh, the lines of um, eliminate your preferred outcomes. Eliminate preferred outcomes. Right, and that's, that's kind of how we approach things sometimes. Okay, God, here's my situation, and I'd really like it if this is what you did. Right, and he's like, what if we just take it to God and say, God, I just want you to be with me, and however 
this goes, if you'll just continue to be with me, I will continue to trust you and I will continue to seek you because your name is Emmanuel and those who know your name trust in you because you, O oh Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So I know your name and I'm going to seek you and you're never going to leave me. You're never going to forsake me. And it's not like the angel appeared and said, hey, Joseph, scratch that decision. I'm going to give you the easy one. Right? He didn't give him the easy one. Hey, Joseph, guess what? You're going to be dad to the son of God. Right? How's that sound? Got that on your resume now, right? It's, no, he didn't give Joseph the preferred path. Joseph was taking the hard path, but the preferred path. And he's like, no, Joseph, this is the way we're going. God with you. His presence is enough. Can I just say that to you, family, one more time before we prayed? Jesus will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. You are included in the us. God with you. However you feel like, it feels like the silence of between the decimals. However you feel like you've weighed your options and you're not sure what to do, God is with you and he will not forsake you and he will be enough for you. And when you lean on him, he will direct your path. That's the promise. Just like he did for Joseph, he does it for us. Can I pray for you now? Let's join together in prayer. Lord Jesus, for my brothers and sisters who need to be encouraged, who need to be assured this morning that you are with them. And because you're with them, in Christ, you are incredibly for them. And if you're for them, how can you, anybody, and would it matter? What would it matter who's against us? Nobody's going to bring a charge that's going to condemn us. Jesus bore the charge. He will save his people from their sin. Good news. The one who saves is the one who's with. And so I pray, God, that you would comfort my brothers and sisters, this morning, with your presence. But Lord, we also know that um, your promise is also given to people in need of courage, to people who are discouraged. And so Lord, may your presence encourage and conquer fear in the lives of my brothers and sisters this morning. May your presence encourage my brothers and sisters who are just, who want to be head first in the Great Commission during these trying, difficult times and aren't sure how to do it. You're with us when we go to the ends of the earth. You're with us when we make disciples. So Lord Jesus, be with us as our strength. Be with us as our joy. Be with us as our comfort. Be with us as our peace. Be with us as our hope. Be with us as our power. Be with us as our confidence. Be with us as our kindness and our love. Be with us as our patience, because we're in times where it seems like a lot of us are waiting. Be with us as our patience. Be with us as our meekness. Be with us as our self-control. Be with us as all we need. Encourage my brothers and sisters with this truth. Encourage all of us with this truth. In the name of Jesus who saves, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, family. Hope to see you in a day that's not too far away. Have a great, great Sunday. Thank you.